how the mighty have fallen. Boeing, a company that was long a stalwart of aviation excellence and almost synonymous with quality and innovation, has become embroiled in controversy after controversy ranging from questionable safety decisions and engineering mishaps to corporate mismanagement. But how did this happen? Hi, my name is James and I'm the curator at Libero.com. Today I'm going to explore the question of how Boeing lost its mojo and how they might be able to get it back. Let's take a trip back through time. It's the mid-1960s at Boeing. The 707 has become the workhorse for transcontinental and transoceanic travel. The 727 is clearly becoming a success, and between 1965 and 1968, the payroll has almost doubled. Sales are robust, and the company has diversified into aerospace with its involvement in the Saturn boosters and lunar roving vehicle. A new airplane, the 747, is in design and looks to revolutionize air travel. Times are good, but storm clouds are forming on the horizon, and by the end of the decade, it would become a hurricane. In truth, the costs of developing the 747 and also the 737 were higher than expected. The airliner market had become saturated and new orders were tapering off. To add fuel to the fire, another program, the SST, or supersonic transport, was having its own struggles and would eventually be canceled. By 1970, it was full-on financial crisis, with no new orders coming in for the year from any U.S. airline. Boeing had borrowed over $2 billion to finance the 747 and the company was in existential crisis. But they persevered. Solid leadership, technical innovation, and fortitude, among other factors, turned Boeing's fortunes. Calculated risks and a belief in their ideals paid off. The 737 and 747 went on to become iconic aircraft with tremendous success for the company. The leadership displayed by individuals like T.A. Wilson, Boeing's president, and Joe Sutter, the 747's design team manager, cannot be understated. There's just no way around it. Commercial airliner production is a risky business with a lot of variables and moving parts. Economics can change rapidly. Innovation is risky. But if you want to play, you have to be prepared to ante up. And to win big, you have to be willing to bet big. Fast forward to the 1990s. With a series of successes like the 757, 767, and the new 777, Boeing is now facing serious competition from Europe. Airbus is ascending, starting with the A300 twin and seeing success with its new A320 single aisle, they are now looking to dethrone the 747 as the queen of the skies with a new aircraft, the A3XX, the plane that would eventually become the A380, to compete with Boeing's long-haul dominance. For their part, Boeing was looking at the new Challenger carefully to formulate a response to this threat. But Boeing couldn't make the numbers work. Their projections for the market just didn't justify the costs and risks associated with the new Super Jumbo. They believed, rightfully so, that the market was moving to a point-to-point -point model of travel as opposed to the hub-and-spoke concept embraced by Airbus. They dipped their toe in the pond rather timidly with the modified 747X, but never really committed. Unlike Airbus, Boeing did not enjoy the safety of government-backed loans and decided it wasn't worth the risk for a market that couldn't justify significant production numbers. And here's where things start to get interesting. It wasn't just about the numbers, it was about the optics. Airbus was loudly building the largest passenger airliner in history, an engineering marvel, and it made Boeing look like they had lost their leadership in the market. The large airplane didn't make financial sense and they knew it, but something had to be done to address what was quickly becoming a PR nightmare. On March 29, 2001, the public got its first glimpse at Boeing's response. Enter the Sonic Cruiser, a sleek, futuristic-looking airliner designed to fly at nearly the speed of sound. With its rear-mounted engines and crank delta wing, it didn't look like the conventional tube and wing planes the public had become accustomed to. It was to use advanced materials like composites and titanium, and Boeing expected it to fly higher than contemporary aircraft and significantly cut travel times on long routes. But innovative as it looked, interest from the airlines was tepid, and following the impact that 9-11 had on the industry, Boeing favored a less risky approach with a more conventional-looking but highly efficient aircraft that became the 787 Dreamliner. The Dreamliner made sense economically for airlines and incorporated many of the technological innovations derived from the work on the Sonic Cruiser, but it still looked conventional. On paper, it was the safer option. No new super jumbo, no radical transonic aircraft, just a highly efficient twin-engine airliner designed for the bottom line. Business is business, but nothing great ever emerged from the drafting tables of accountants. While Boeing was looking at the efficiency of the airplane, they were also looking at transforming the company into an integrator, where assemblies and sub-assemblies would be built by a partnership of suppliers from around the globe. Decisions appeared to be more about financial gain than maintaining engineering and legacy subject matter expertise. To the outside, it looked like Wall Street was making the decisions, 
and Boeing paid a heavy price. The 787 program was wrought with problems. Suppliers lacked expertise and experience. New materials and technology brought unanticipated problems. Parts were late, did not fit, or underperformed, and Boeing was forced to pivot. Work had to be brought back in-house. The jet was late, a PR disaster, and the program was hemorrhaging money. Could it have been avoided with more focus on engineering and quality as opposed to the financial temptations of outsourcing? Hindsight is always 2020, but there were certainly signs that would have made the previous generation of Boeing leadership raise an eyebrow or two. Fast forward to recent history. Engine technology had advanced to the point that Airbus felt that they could offer a significant efficiency improvement to their best-selling A320 narrowbody, and Boeing had a problem. The A320 sat higher off the ground and could accommodate a larger diameter engine than the 737, a key contributor to improving engine efficiency and reducing fuel burn. This represented a significant threat to the stalwart 737, a plane that had been originally designed in the 1960s. Boeing's solution to this problem wasn't to concede that this brilliant but aged design was past its prime and develop a new aircraft, but rather to save money and risk by trying to coax new efficiency improvements from an old airframe. Through what some might see as rather questionable engineering, Boeing proposed the 737 MAX, which included moving the engines further forward and higher on the wing in an attempt to give additional clearance for a larger diameter engine. This resulted in changes to the performance characteristics of the aircraft, leading to the need for control logic and systems to help pilots transitioning from older 737 models to the new MAX. Making matters worse, the company also made safety considerations an option, leading to tragic consequences. At the same time, Boeing is facing pressures on another of its models, the 777. With the original design now over 30 years old, Boeing has spent the last several years making major design updates to improve passenger capacity and efficiency with the new 777X. But that program has also run into some serious problems, with engine mounts causing program delays and safety concerns. The optics have been terrible for Boeing, with the public now questioning the products of a company that has historically been noted for its engineering prowess and commitment to safety and quality. Boeing is at a crossroads. Are they still a relevant innovator? Are they committed to engineering excellence and product quality or more concerned with stock price? Is the company going to be aerospace or cash focused? Should leaders be based on merit or politics? Boeing badly needs a win in the commercial sector and perhaps the new mid-sized airplane is the program that can give it to them. But it has been addled with false starts and does it really capture the hearts and minds when it comes to innovation? New ideas from competitors like Boom Technology and companies overseas need to be considered carefully. And if you think a startup can't be a disruptor, you need only look at what SpaceX has done in the launch sector. Obviously, there are many concerns in operating a company of Boeing size and complexity. It's easy for outsiders to armchair quarterback and proclaim that the company's decisions are misguided without having to deal with the associated risks and consequences. But that doesn't mean that they're wrong. Maybe to find its future path, Boeing should take a hard look at its past. As a company with a proud history of innovation and engineering excellence, and perhaps most importantly, a willingness to take risks. Maybe taking a look at how things used to be done is a good start, and perhaps some of that mojo can come back. A strong Boeing is good for the aerospace community, to push us forward and help foster healthy competition and innovation. It's time for the leaders to step up, channel the T.A. Wilsons and Joe Sutters, and chart a course to restore Boeing to its rightful place. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing. It helps us to grow the channel and provide more of this content. And if you love aviation, come visit us at Libero.com and browse our catalog of aircraft and aviation subjects. As always, thank you for your time and consideration, and we hope to speak with you again soon.